Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to our Southeastern Division Neurodevelopmental Disorder event. My name is Hesham Al Nader. I'm a consultant psychiatrist in General Psychiatry, and I'm the academic secretary for the Southeastern Division. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I'll go through some housekeeping notes to begin with. Please use the Q&A box for questions for our speakers. Please indicate who you want the question directed to. Um, if you have any technical problems, please put this in the Q&A box and it will be dealt with as quickly as possible. We're very pleased to make this webinar come together despite challenging times of COVID pandemic, hopefully coming to an end. And uh, it's to mention that we are looking forward for our first face-to-face -face event in the spring conference in Prescott Street in May. And we, we hope that we can see you all there. I would like to thank you all for your attendance today. And I would like to thank all the speakers. We have a number of world-class speakers today uh, who have made this event possible. The subcommittee leads for this event, myself and Professor Rafi Faruqi, um, the head of our division. Many thanks to Karen Morgan uh, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a South Asian Division Manager, uh, who is also part of our subcommittee. And many thanks to Chesney Monrose for helping putting this event together. Um, this event will be recorded and the video link will, um, will be made available approximately about two weeks following the event. And it will be made available for two months following the event. Um, please use your speaker view as this will give you a better viewing option. Please don't forget to fill out the feedback forms. The link will be sent to you in the chat at the end of the event and also by emails. Attendance certificates will be sent within two weeks of the event. And please tweet throughout the event. Use hashtag SED NeuroDAV 2022. Now I'd like to hand over to Professor Rafi Faruqi, who will give an overview of the day and welcome the audience and um, the speakers. Over to you, Rafi. Uh, thank you, Hisham, Karen, uh, Chesney. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event. On behalf of Royal College of Psychiatrists, Southeast Division, I welcome you uh, to participate, ask questions. Thank you to our uh, distinguished lineup of speakers, a number of them old friends, and thank you for your support to Southeast Division in putting this excellent program together. Thank you to Academic uh, Committee and our college management uh, team. Uh, for supporting this event. This is our way of engaging with our membership, also supporting highest quality CPD. And in particular, at this time, raising awareness of neurodevelopmental disorders. It is an expanding field in terms of psychiatric research, expanding field in terms of our awareness of clinical practice. And we want this CPD to contribute towards giving out the message uh, that we need better services and better accessible services for this patient group. We also give out the message that when we see uh, our patients in secondary care, primary care, or tertiary care psychiatric services, they sometimes have a neurodevelopmental condition. Recognition of these conditions is important to understand the person, to understand their social context, to understand their communication context in order to provide the highest quality service that we aspire to provide to our patients. Message to 
families or of, of our patient groups that Royal College of Psychiatrists will continue to support and promote message of highest quality care to all relevant stakeholders. On this point, uh, and wel welcoming our speakers and participants again, I hand back to Dr. Hisham uh, Al-Nazar. Hisham, uh, thank you very much for putting uh, this program together. Well done. Uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafi, for your nice words. And we're, without further ado, shall we uh, begin the day? So the first speaker is Professor Tom Burney. Um, Professor Burney was trained as a child psychiatrist in Newcastle, only to become an ID consultant working across North East England for the next 35 years. Um, he was drawn increasingly to autism, a blend of inpatients, community services, legal services, parental organizations, research and teaching. The exciting cooperative of autism world. Um, without further ado, I will invite um, Dr. Bernie to to give us uh, his very interesting speech on neurodevelopmental conditions and evolving and expanding concepts. Oh. Thank you. Um, I want to give a general introduction to a group of disorders, which um, they're developmental, they have a childhood onset, they're persistent over time. Um, and as such, they're not mental illness. They, they don't have the, this episodic quality with a pre morbid personality and that uh, psychiatrists have learned to work with. The neurodevelopmental disorders are core elements in developmental psychiatry, in child psychiatry, and in intellectual disability psychiatry, but have largely gone unnoticed in other areas of the field. Um, I list uh, the, on the left the kinds of developmental disorders that psychiatry has been concerned with. There are others, um, language disorders, uh, dyspraxia, clumsiness, learning disorders, uh, speech disorders, which um, have been dealt with by speech and language therapy, OT, physio, psychology, rather than psychiatry. Um, but how, how have we developed our concepts? How, how do we see them? How did we get here? Um, the story really began over 200 years ago with uh, ADHD. Um, and we identify clusters of characteristics and group them into syndromes. I find a very useful analogy uh, in the way early man identified stars and grouped them into constellations. When it came to ADHD, uh, the nucleus was identified fairly early on. Uh, distractibility and fidgetiness, um, the impulsivity kind of drifted in later. A fairly uh, useful um, memory, uh, aid memoir, were the uh, descriptions Heinrich Hoffman put together in the middle of the 19th century, uh, Struel Peter, um, I don't know how many of you have come across this, but uh, Fidgety Philip is a splendid picture of a child with ADHD and his family struggling to cope with it. Um, the next landmark uh, is uh, perhaps Charles Bradley, who in 1937 was researching this. And they were using air encephalography, uh, which left people with a tremendous headache. Um, and he tried giving 
uh, his patient's Benadryl post AEG uh, because it stimulated the choroid plexus. Um, and it, it was very successful, not in uh, helping their headaches, but in uh, changing the behavior of um, oh, nearly half of them. And um, the other uh, development was the idea from about the 1900s that the, this might be rooted in minimal brain damage. And because they couldn't pinpoint any damage, by the 1960s, uh, they were talking about minimal brain dysfunction. I'll come back to etiology um, in a moment. But if we look at some of the other conditions that were identified as developmental, uh, Kushmal uh, identified world blindness in the middle of the 19th century. Um, which turned into dyslexia. Uh, MacDonald Critchley in the mid 60s was the person who really publicized this and developed it. Um, Gersman uh, identifying damage of the parietal lobe as producing dyscalculia, then went on with Kosk to identify developmental dyscalculia. Um, as a developmental condition rather than a, a post-traumatic one. Um, on the motor side, uh, clumsiness has been recognized from the early 1900s um, and became well known with the publication of a book in 1972 on the clumsy child. And this has turned into dyspraxia and developmental coordination disorder in the international classifications. Um, ticks have been known since Tourette, uh, um, who identified malady de tic, uh, linking it to phonic ticks as well as motor ticks uh, into Tourette, what we know as Tourette disorder. And there'll be a lot more detail about that this afternoon. The biggie um, in which all the money and research has been done is autism. And the earliest records uh, of cases are actually, with hindsight, back in 1926 from a clinic in Kiev. Uh, but um, uh, in and pre war in 1938, Louise Desper described the clutch of children as having childhood schizophrenia, who were, with hindsight, autistic. But this set the hair running of a unitary psychosis, that uh, if you developed schizophrenia in childhood, in early childhood, you developed autism. And if you developed the same condition later on in adole adolescence or early adulthood, it was schizophrenia. That link didn't wasn't really broken until the mid 1970s with uh, research by Z. Colvin, which clearly split the two. I think one of the characteristics of work in this area is that people have an idea and everyone uh, focuses in on the idea and it's very black and white. So it's all childhood schizophrenia, it's all schizophrenia, and then it's all quite separate. Um, we're still left with a puzzling group of, a very small group of autistic children who go on to develop uh, quite florid schizophrenia in early puberty. And I'm not quite sure what to make of those. Um, but we've, as I say, from um, schizophrenia was, uh, sorry. Autism was uh, re really definitively identified by uh, Kanner and Asperger in the early 1940s, um, partly because of fluency of their writing. Their papers are uh, very descriptive. And they both focused on the lack of effective content 
contact. Um, by the, from the 1980s onwards, uh, Mike Rutter and Lorna Wing have uh, honed and developed a concept of what is autism, um, picking out impaired communication, impaired sociability, and uh, rigidity with uh, repetitive actions and behaviours. Um, and latterly, uh, been highlighted as well, the sensory focus, the sensory sensitivity that uh, is an addition, recognized as being uh, characteristic of autism, but occurs in other conditions. So we've, we've got this um, clutch of stars developed. When we put these together, um, go, going back to my uh, analogy of a star-studded sky, um, and particularly when we add other conditions, um, for intellectual disability, which is a big developmental disorder, the speech and language disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, which can be seen as a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, and uh, seizures, which Mike Kerr is coming on to this afternoon. Add to this uh, symptoms which are kind of growing into disorders in their own right, alexithymia, the difficulty in describing internal sensations and feelings, prosopagnosia, the difficulty in recognizing faces, and all the gender uh, and sexual and gender um, difficulties. And then uh, somewhere in the center put poor executive function, a very complex condition, which seems to run across neurodevelopmental psychiatry. Um, we're left with a, a milky way. We make sense of this porridge um, of symptoms like early man by identifying constellations. So we've got ADHD, um, autism, and motor tics accompanied by phonic tics as Tourette. I think the difficulty with this approach is that if you uh, look for pure clusters and you gather populations, on the basis that they have that cluster and compare them with other populations that don't have any uh, disorder, um, you wind up with pure clusters. Uh, it's rather misleading um, uh, approach. But we've developed our idea of neurodevelopmental disorders by um, a sort of classic approach to looking for a medical disorder. We look for typical presentations, but the catch is that their elements vary <coughs> in not only in their nature, but in their number and intensity. Lorna Wing coined the term an autistic spectrum, by which she was thinking about the variety of colors that go to make up white light. The idea, of, the other idea of a spectrum being a continuum of se severity uh, really came much later. Um, we've also uh, looked at etiology and looked for a common etiology in this, in, uh, amongst disorders. Um, and here, to begin with, people were looking at primary disorders only. Um, idiopathic, autism. Autism is secondary to an innate condition or secondary to another disorder, such as um, uh, oh, any of the disorders that produce learning disability. Um, or disorders, Result from external 
agencies like um, encephalitis or trauma um, somehow weren't real autism. Um, Gilberg uh, early on saw the fallacy in this and was looking for other causes of autism. He, he, he felt if we investigated anyone thoroughly enough, we'd find an underlying um, secondary a cause for the autism, which was secondary to. Um, Mike Rutter at the same time was hunting after first one gene, uh, then four genes, and then as genetics moved on, it became clear that uh, um, we were into um, many genes and many minor genetic anomalies. Um, so the common etiology, it's, uh, these conditions are certainly familiar, but uh, the single gene, single disorder um, aspiration is gone. Um, the third approach to this was to look for an underlying marker. Um, bar markers, uh, abnormal biochemistry or physiology or anatomy. Um, the site of the underlying le lesion. Um, and linked to that, the search for an end endophenotypes, psychological or physiological mechanisms, which would explain um, why the person had autism, why the person had ADHD, what, what, what lay beneath this. It wasn't necessarily the cause, it was the machinery. Um, so a standard medical approach to identifying a disorder that could be treated. The problem with this was um, people didn't, was finding the right mechanism to think of. Initially was starting off with a specific cause, a gene, a group of genes, um, interfering with a, um, the workings of a specific module within the brain um, and producing a specific outcome. An example is uh, um, the fusiform gyrus. Uh, if um, impaired, um, produces precipitate conclusion. Fine from adult functional cortical map mapping in adults um, doesn't work with uh, deve developmental conditions. Here yeah, we need a different model, which is a specific cause affecting a developing brain. So whatever impact it has is going to set off a cascade of effects, which, which will set off further cascades and can have many outcomes many differing outcomes. This is a, a um, the, the genetic idea of pleiotropy um, taken uh, a stage further. Um, uh, uh, other thing that's really become clear in the last decade is that the developing brain is affected by its environment. Deprivation can produce um, innate uh, functional change in the brain, physiological change, and will have its own uh, physiological outcomes. Um, so deprivation can produce not just uh, reactive attachment disorders, but also uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. But a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, will have an impact on his environment. He will wind up the victim. 
the outsider, the bullied child, the pride child, the battered child. Um, and so you have the outcomes influencing the environment. And you end up with this porridge of uh, machinery. Um, <clears throat> What then are the characteristics of this um, very complicated neurodevelopmental disorder? Um, well, first, it's uh, something innate, and it's going to change over time. Um, maturation, uh, it used to be thought children grew out of, of a lot of neurodevelopmental disorder, whether it was clumsiness or um, attention deficit disorder. Um, it was also recognized that uh, innate factors like illness could set the child back. Um, the child's well being would affect the presentation and development of neurodevelopmental disorder. Linked to that, um, it'll change with environment. Uh, put the person into a more sympathetic environment, put an um, autistic nerd into a computer laboratory, or a very militaristic or monastic society with clear rules and predictability, and the disorder gets much milder, the symptoms get milder. And then there's the role of adaptation, uh, learning how to compensate for your symptoms, how to hide them in autism, masking. It's rather like um, we all have uh, things we would rather not be. And we learn manners and we learn behavior and we. Uh, can, uh, if it's sufficiently mild and if we're sufficiently dedicated, we can uh, um, mask it. Um, in uh, in some like autism, the, the, using the term masking implies it's much more difficult. Um, it's not just learning uh, learning manners. It's perhaps more akin to uh, learning how to drive in very heavy, very fast traffic and keeping it up hour after hour. Um, more, um, yeah. Leads on to an interesting point. It gives us a developmental trajectory. Um, if you look at birth to um, adulthood, uh, the intensity of the disorder, the prominence of symptoms um, varies over time. In uh, autism, quite often it's at its most obvious in early childhood, may not be present at birth. In a third of children, autism seems to come on, the symptoms come on at 18 months. Um, may uh, become much fainter in the calm of primary school, only to heighten when faced with uh, oh, the hormonal storm and the stressful surrounds of secondary school. And, um, and then as the uh, adolescent escapes from school and moves into the calm of adulthood, um, the symptoms may improve. Uh, in uh, you see something similar in epilepsy, where if you get beyond the early childhood um, without getting seizures, uh, you perhaps are unlikely, unlikely to get seizures later on until you start running into old age and dementia. Um, ticks were, uh, are, most ticks are grown out of. Uh, by adulthood, um, start started about stop 
come on with adolescence and evaporate with adolescence, um, except in the case of, uh, well, the campuses, particularly Tourette's. Um, but it is de depends on the environment. Um, oh, I'm just drawing a picture of something which may be quite clear cut in adulthood, in a quite clear cut if it's above a certain threshold, below the threshold, and the symptoms are subclinical, is it sort of actually there? Um, if somebody doesn't have fits for three years or two years, we stop calling them epileptic. Um, somehow we go on calling them autistic. Uh, people are allowed to grow out of some disorders, but not others. Um, if the person are neurodevelopmental disorders lifelong, if the person is subject to stress, developing a, an autistic person, moving into a difficult marriage, uh, or moving out of a difficult marriage, may improve or deteriorate, and the autism may re-emerge. I'm wanting to get across the idea that uh, um, neurodevelopmental uh, traits may continue lifelong. It doesn't mean you have a neurodevelopmental condition. The next um, problem with our concept was finding that these syndromes that I charted, these constellations, are not isolated, nor are they discrete. Um, we talk about comorbidity. Uh, if you have autism, um, you have a 30% chance of having ADHD, a 70% chance of being dyspractic, a 5 to 15% chance of ha having epilepsy at some point in your life. And the more pronounced um, your condition, the more numerous your symptoms, the more likely you are to have other disorders and other symptoms. And as my aid memoir to fix in your minds, I'm showing buses which never come evenly distributed and alone. The second thing is that symptom clusters overlap. The boundaries are blurred. Cluster analysis of uh, um, neurodevelopmental symptomatology does not produce clear-cut sorting. Um, the, it leaves uh, everyone jumbled together. Um, unless you feed in just the core symptoms, the, the defining symptoms for each. The next uh, important <coughs> recognition is a, a continuum. Uh, and the idea that um, we've identified condition of disorder, um, but it, you can, it's present all the way back into the general population as trays. Um, and probably in, um, it's hard to say how many people have trays. Terry will talk this afternoon about uh, the prevalence of having some condition, which is probably as high as 10 to 15 percent of people have a neurodevelopmental uh, condition. Many more of their uh, acquaintances and family will have fragments, tendencies, traits. It's, it's not, this isn't uh, something new. 
we've long recognized that personality disorders and personality types have a, a presentational link. Separating the traits from this traits, when does a tray become a disorder? Well, you talk about significant impairment as being the threshold at, at which uh, we identify the disorder. Rather, rather difficult because <clears throat> the significance is a very subjective um, term. If you go, if you're a clinician looking into somebody's characteristics, do it hard enough and you'll find uh, trays. Are these trays um, sig significant enough to be counted towards uh, a diagnosis? Is there distractibility? Is there fidgetiness prominent enough for them to have ADHD? Um, is there a connection of, oh, uh, um, Harry Potter, Harry Potter figures, unusual enough to qualify as a focal interest. Do they spend enough time on, uh, used to be Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, connecting for again, for it to be a focal interest. So clinicians are very um, variable in, the, in the, how, frequently they diagnose a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, and patients uh, are the anxious patient will see abnormal traits uh, in everything they, they do. The more confident patient will say nothing wrong with me. It's his family that say, we think you have a problem. Um, so significant impairment is not a terribly good um, distinction between tray and disorder. The other thing I want to um, with is the idea of neurodiversity. Um, rather seeing Rather than seeing the uh, world as being um, normal and neurotypical, and people with uh, a neurodevelopmental disorder, a condition and an abnormality, um, the neurodivergent uh, minority, neurodivergent has been coined as a term for those people who are different and the emphasis on being different rather than this disorder. And parallel examples are um, in race and gender. Uh, it raises the issue of how, um, how, how uh, much non-white ancestry makes you black. Um, the, there's a degree of self-identification um, and fuzziness about uh, the, your difference. But it has, it does emphasize yeah, the concept of neurodiversity, emphasizes strengths as well as depth deficits, um, that it gets away from uh, disorders are all bad. They come with things like creative, creativity, persistence, um, the ability to hyper-focus, um, unusual skills. It's a social model of disability um, and <clears throat> Um, it's a model of where the neurodivergent population should be included 
by adaptations to the world, by appropriate adjustments towards developing a world that values and accommodates this minority as well as in the typical majority. Um, one, uh, um, one fact, one way this sh uh, is, is showing is research projects, particularly in autism, um, include people with autism in uh, their planning and execution. Uh, no, no research, no research about autism without no research about us without us is a catchphrase. So with these with this new newer con these newer concepts of neurodevelopment disorders, how do we how do we use them? How do we label people? Well um, clinically we still need categorical diagnoses for our patients. <clears throat> we need a concept that um, makes us think about what else might this person have, a concept that uh, the person themselves can go away, uh, Google, um, find others with a similar diagnosis, uh, develop an identity round. Um, it is the start of a treatment plan, um, and it's the start of it's a, it's a gateway to services, which uh, tend to get defined by labels, by categorical diagnoses. We need categorical diagnoses. We still need ICD and DSM to communicate. The catch is that these do perpetuate our existing categories. Um, so in research, we need a transdiagnostic approach, which um, we use focus on symptoms rather than syndromes. We look beyond our um, pure condition. We look at the rest of the sky and we recruit uh, varied groups, recruiting by service need, um, the year they were born, a cohort, um, recru recruiting by um, the difficulties they present with, but getting away from existing stereotypes and looking at the broader population. Um, that in turn modifies our categories, which is uh, where we've got to today. And thank you. That's a uh, uh, good stop. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I don't think we have time for questions. Yes, we indeed do. Um, so I'll, I'll read the question because actually it's very well worded. Do you think the subclinical phases are actually well compensated for or well managed phases? And to what extent does environment play a role in a neurodevelopmental disorder being well compensated for? Gosh, um, well, I think there are, that's why I listed the three um, elements in uh, somebody's changes and the change moving from clinical to subclinical and back again. Um, not just age and maturation, but uh, very much learned comp compensation. Um, and well, uh, if you're in a comfortable environment and you're reasonably well, you don't have to 
do as much. Um, oh, interviewing somebody with autism. Um, it's not, ask, not asking how they get on with other people at work uh, if they're in an IT laboratory or in the non service. It's asking how they get on with other people uh, at a social meeting, at a wedding, at a um, in the pub, whatever. And uh, so, it's, it, and you can't really take them apart. It's a blend of both environment and uh, how the person's working into it and what their um, their own status, their physical state. Have I? Yes, thank you very much for that. Actually, um, yeah, I, I like the, 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 the euphemism you used with the stars. Actually, I think that was quite creative. Thanks for that. Makes us think differently. But based on that, do you think that clinical provisions should also move forward, move uh, more towards uh, transdiagnostic frameworks and not only the research groups. In as much as clinical conditions uh, should be gathering information for research, um, yes. But in their primary task, clinical work, um, it's uh, well. Actually, psychiatry does tend to treat symptoms rather than conditions. And so you give somebody a stimulant, uh, um, hoping they'll treat their overactivity and inattentiveness. Uh, and the impulsiveness is a bonus if it's treated. Um, you treat uh, somebody with. Um, autism with uh, an SRI uh, in the hope of softening their uh, rigidity and obsessiveness. Um, so psychiatry does treat symptoms. Uh, the discovers so, yeah, yeah, so, visions don't, um, don't always line up as such as, well, in, in certain areas, they are rather um, separate. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Bernie. This was quite uh, enchanting, I thought. Actually, I, I lost this count of time as we spoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> without further ado, um, I would move on to introducing our next speaker. So, Professor Digby Tanton, who will uh, give us a talk on psychosocial support for patients with neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, Professor Digby um, uh, was, well, um, uh, ran a clinic for assessment for adults with autism uh, from 1981 to 2020, and uh, he moved on to be a senior lecturer and honorary consultant in general psychiatry at the University, the University of Manchester. He's the first UK chair in psychotherapy at the University of Warwick, now Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry, University of Sheffield, and Visiting Professor of Psychology in Middlesex University, and Director, New School of Psychotherapy and Counselling. Um, so over to you, Professor Digby, who will give us a talk about psychosocial support for patients with neurodevelopmental conditions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, so, like Tom, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm afraid I don't start quite as dramatically and astronomically as him, but uh, we'll see how we get on. So, here we go. Okay, and we need that view. And it's the wrong place, of course, so here we go. Right. Okay, so that's my title. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, Hesham mentioned that uh, in the, currently in the new School of Psychotherapy and Counselling, we have courses in autism, incidentally, um, but I'm not supposed to advertise, so I won't. Um, Tom has given a masterful uh, summary of the whole field of neurodevelopmental disorders. It's interesting that this is a new concept. Um, the concept of there being a group of neurodevelopmental disorders that includes disorders of intellectual development. So for the first time uh, for a very long time, psychiatry and uh, what would have been called mental illnesses and psychiatry of intellectual disability have been merged. Um, and I think it's a very useful development. I'm not gonna look at um, all of these things because Tom's already done it and he's pointed out that they all overlap in a very interesting way. Uh, this is from ICD-11, which became public this year. Very useful document. It's got a great little browser you can look up things in uh, and it's free. So that's a big improvement on DSM-5. Um, ICD-11, the guy who did this particular section came to the college and we had a very lively discussion with him. Um, and I like to think in a small way, our group, which I'm pretty sure included Tom, um, influenced some of the developments. But an interesting development too is that there is a concept of secondary neurodevelopmental syndrome, which means that you can somehow have or present with similar features to a neurodevelopmental syndrome, but you've acquired those in later life. I think that's going to be a bit contentious, um, but it's an interesting idea because it maybe explains the fact that uh, by the time you're uh, an adolescent, you may not have got a diagnosis, and indeed you might get to 70 without a diagnosis. So people may present to a, a general psychiatry clinic um, without any di diagnosis and uh, you know the first diagnosis might take place when they're um, after that presentation. I'm going to be talking about autism spectrum disorder but most of what I say will have some relevance I think. I apologize to my child psychiatry colleagues, I'm not going to talk about children um, but I need to mention them a little bit more than I was planning to. I wasn't expecting so many of you to be here. Um, a lot of my talk will be focused on, uh, general, on general psychiatry um, because that's my kind of first love, avocation in psychiatry, but also because in some ways I think we found in our, in our group studying you know, or sharing information about neurodevelopmental disorders, I think it's a SIG now, um, that general psychiatrists have had the most difficulty in some ways in liaising with us because I think generally you all think that you're very, very busy, which is true. And, you know, this is asking you to just take on a whole new and complicated field. So it's great to see so many of you here. Well, I'm not seeing you, uh, unfortunately, that's the nature of webinars, but you're seeing me. So I, I'll reach out to you now virtually. So um, I'm just going to say a few very short things about the, the diagnosis, not because I want to focus on that and uh, Parche and my child and adolescent colleagues who know all about this. So basically, um, and I think Tom mentioned this too, there are two bits to a diagnosis of autism nowadays. There used to be three. Um, and the first bit, the most important bit, is impaired social communication and social interaction. Now, that's something that as psychiatrists, we've never paid much attention to. We've never really looked at it. We talk about depressed facies without really thinking what that means in terms of social communication. We talk about some aspects of uh, people with schizophrenia's social communication, but we don't look too carefully at it. Autism requires us to have a a much better understanding of social communication and particularly nonverbal communication. As you all know, uh, theory of mind exploded on us as a result of the work of Dame Uta Frith and uh, Sir Simon 
Baron Cohen. Um, but actually, I don't think that's the key to this kind of social communication, although it's been linked to autism, it's better related to speech and language communication difficulties. Um, what the problem is in the autistic syndrome, I think, is in nonverbal communication. So restricted and repetitive um, behaviors are the second bit, and you need to have those to have a diagnosis of autism at all, um, even though quite often clinically they're not terribly obvious. So what is more obvious is language impairment. In fact, when Mike Rutter uh, started writing about autism, he thought that it was the verbal difficulty that people with autism had um, was, the, was the main issue. Now, of course, language impairment is characteristic of people with autism and lower uh, IQ, um, but as autism has grown and expanded to take in a wider and wider concept, so more and more people are being diagnosed with autism who don't have uh, low IQ. Indeed, they may have high IQs, or there's no particular correlation between high IQ and autism either. Um, and so language impairment is clearly no longer a part of the requirement of autism, but it's often associated. In fact, it's one of those things that, as Tom said, form part of the whole constellation we see in the sky. Interestingly, of course, what we see in the sky is a stars that might be very distant from each other, but are superimposed on each other. So um, the map he, he showed us and we're still studying might turn out to be quite different um, in some ways to uh, in the future. Okay, so Tom has mentioned some of the difficulties. He gives a figure for epilepsy, ADHD, his my figure is a bit higher. Um, Tourette, he said all these things, so I don't want to say more about those. Um, but what I do want to talk about, because my talk is about psychosocial interventions, is about what happens to people with autism as they grow up. Um, and because those are the bits you can actually deal with typically. Um, it's possible that at a very early age, psychosocial interventions will affect the fundamental difficulties in nonverbal communication and social interaction, because of course we acquire nonverbal communication through social interaction. Although we're probably born primed to uh, orientate to faces and look at people's eyes and so on. Um, but then we go on to learn from our mother's expressions, our carer's expressions, lots of stuff um, about the structure of our societies around us. So a lot of speculation at the moment about whether if you pick up autism at a very early age, maybe six, nine months, if that were possible, you could change things. Um, but at a later age, we're not really looking much at changing the fundamental, well, I'm not gonna say difficulty, the fundamental difference, because as Tom also said, lots of people would say, it's not a difficulty, it's just, I'm a bit different from you. Even if it's my brain that's different, doesn't make me pathological in some way. So what we're dealing with in, say, from middle childhood onwards, is the impact of difficulties in social interaction or alterations in how people interact socially and how other people react to them. So there's more, a great deal more anxiety in most children and most adults with autism. There possibly is a, a tendency for anxiety to be more commonly present in mothers of autistic children. That, of course, might be secondary. It's hard to be a mother or a father of an autistic child, uh, typically. Um, although later in life, you might rather like your autism, your child with an autistic disorder or your autistic child, as people prefer to, to be called, um, because you actually might be more interested in being with mum um, than being with anybody else. 
but it, in childhood, fantastic pressure on parents. Uh, all, all those of you who are working with families will know that. Um, so there may be a genetic link as well, but as Tom said, genetics isn't you know, now about mapping one gene over here that's transmitted to another gene over there or another or a persistent genetic abnormality in your children. Forensic issues, aggression might be an issue. I put that in just because I saw some of you were, were in the forensic faculty. Maybe I would ask if you had any questions about that, it might be better to leave it to questions. I don't want to make a big deal of forensic issues in, in children, although uh, Asperger in his 1943 paper mentioned uh, that children with uh, his, what's come to be called, what briefly was called his syndrome, could be malicious, but um, that's not a main feature, so let's leave that to one side. So what other th problems? Well, the bigger problem is you are victimized by other people. Bullying is an enormous problem and it's relevant in this talk, as I'm gonna say, because actually that's one of the most important psychosocial interventions that all psychiatrists have to consider, how to avoid uh, people with autism at whatever age being bullied or victimized in some way uh, by the system. And many people with autism describe dissatisfaction with their treatment by the system, at least they did in Sheffield when we did a community study. Um, they were particularly dissatisfied with the treatment of their epilepsy in, in the neurology clinic. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a bit. Marginalization, just routinely being left out of things is another big problem for people with autism. Loneliness is a, is a considerable problem in adolescence. Um, and then there's the issue of information overload and meltdowns. One of the difficulties for parents is that um, sometimes their children suddenly burst out in, in a kind of rage uh, or temper tantrum. Um, and that can involve aggression towards them, uh, breaking objects. Um, and often that's traced back to an uh, an ongoing developing frustration about something or being presented with a situation that requires a decision that's hard for the person with autism to take because they don't have, um, they have to make the decision for themselves without being able to go along with the decisions that other people might normally make. Um, people with autism, as all of you will know if you've met some in your families or in your practice, are very original. They like to do their, they like to lead the life that they think is right and important for them. And sometimes that makes it really hard to choose a, a way to go. Another issue that people with autism has that leads to identity problems in adolescence, and again, um, has uh, raised some interest recently in terms of gender and uh, the apparent preponderance or increased numbers proportion of people seeking gender reassignment or gender change or support about choosing a non-binary gender um, in specialist gender clinics um, who have autism also. And then there are sensory issues, bright lights, uh, loud noises, uh, distracting kinds of noises, certain noises that hit a particular sensitive frequency for people with a person with autism. Terry's going to talk to you this afternoon whoops, about um, prevalence. Um, Tom mentioned a figure, I think it's probably of, of the order of 1% in children, which is probably conservative. It's less than the figures reported by the CDC in the US. <laughs> But it raises the issue which one questioner raised, which is, is autism a disease that emerges irrespective of circumstances that the person is in, or is it much more like an adapt adaptation to an environment, in which case, is it that the children, 
school for children is more demanding of and leads to apparent increase in autism symptoms um, in childhood. So um, if that were the case, then we would expect a reduction in apparent prevalence. So this is from a, the, the uh, Sheffield community study I mentioned. So the top line is the people we picked up um, through advertisements and so on, who were screened and then given, and we took developmental histories and so on and made a more formal diagnosis. And the red line are the people who already had a diagnosis. So you can see a substantial number of undiagnosed people and the diagnoses uh, were really confined to childhood or there was a little blip in the 20s. But the, for people who we thought had autism, diagnosis um, through the research process uh, found much higher prevalence, but the prevalence dropped. So is this because autism resolves? Well, all of us who work in specialist autism assessment clinics do meet people who apparently have stopped being autistic. Is it because of premature mortality? Um, as the statistician working on the project wondered, well, everybody said, you know, no, that this is not an issue in autism or really perhaps they didn't say, they just neglected the fact that it's an issue in autism, but it clearly is a premature mortality, especially probably in people with autism and epilepsy because, and uh, as you will all know, the mortality in epilepsy is also um, higher than in the general population. But perhaps also there is an increased um, mortality in people without epilepsy, epilepsy, but nobody much knows because people with autism disappear. Uh, they don't pressurize their GP about anything. They become perhaps who knows, eccentric people living with their parents till a, a late age. Um, nobody quite knows, you know, or has followed people with autism up long enough to know what the natural history is, if indeed it's appropriate to call it a natural history. And then people will avoid the diagnosis. So uh, years ago, when I started, it was unheard of to think of doctors of medicine, practicing doctors of medicine, including psychiatrists having autism. Um, now, most of us will have seen at least one doctor and perhaps more than one, um, but they're bullied uh, in the NHS. Uh, I don't know how you feel about the NHS. I've left it a while ago, but um, there's a problem, isn't there, about having to fit in. Um, and so I think a lot of people who may uh, benefit from a diagnosis of autism in different ways, um, don't particularly want to be identified in that way. You might say, well, isn't this all about the widening diagnostic criteria? Uh, and I think that's also true. Tom mentioned camouflaging. Uh, I have a student who's just finished a study of that in women. Um, and there definitely is a great deal more pressure, at least she's found in her study and other people have reported uh, that women have to fit in. And so um, they try and fit in by suppressing their uh, autism symptoms. They practice smiling in front of mirrors, sometimes for several hours. Um, they uh, learn to look people in the eye, even though that makes them very uncomfortable. Um, they even may, memorize certain sorts of phrases you can use generally in the pub um, to avoid anybody picking you out. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, um, it's a bad thing if people feel they can't, they can't do anything else. They're pressurized into doing it. They feel trapped. Um, and it's probably a bad thing because it's exhausting. I thought Tom's example of the, the driving too fast was a a good, a good uh, analogy. Um, but on the other hand, um, it does allow people to fit in and they feel sometimes it's a good sacrifice. There is an autism quality standard, which has been recently revised and that um, 
these are the things that uh, the headings under which um, it's grouped. Uh, the number one standard, of course, is a diagnostic assessment by an autism team. A diagnostic assessment or receiving a diagnosis is, of course, a major kind of psychosocial intervention. Uh, as Tom said, people don't necessarily want it. Um, personally, I always ask people before they leave whether they want to have a diagnosis or not. Um, and just on a few occasions, I've suggested there are some to the patient that there is a downside to having a diagnosis. And we've discussed that. Um, I don't myself put the cutoff for impairment uh, where I think it should be. I ask people how impaired they are. But of course, there is also, as I say, a downside um, if somebody, especially a woman, has a relationship with a man, um, she typically anticipates the man will become rejecting if she has a diagnosis of autism. And unfortunately, that's commonly true. So there's an issue about whether the diagnosis is at least sent to a GP. The other issue is that this requirement that the diagnosis should be made by an autism team, that's so unrealistic. I, I can't believe NICE seriously put that down with a straight face or whoever it was who was drafting it. We, I mean, of course, it would be wonderful if there was an autism team available. Perhaps 1% of the population, broadly speaking, might have autism. Uh, so, you know, does that justify the expenditure? Well, that's not going to happen, I don't think, anytime soon. So, I think a lot of this is a bit sort of pious. And what I like to discuss with you today, or at least put my viewpoint, is what is practicable. Assessment and diagnosis, you think, is, is that the same as one? Well, actually, what Nice meant here was looking at other conditions. Tom pointed out there are lots of related neurodevelopmental conditions, but we'll look at some of the psychiatric disorders that might be associated. Personalized plan. Well, I think that's absolutely essential. That's really the core of things. It doesn't need to be a plan necessarily in the sense of, you know, having a care plan and a coordinator of your care plan and reviewing it every month. It might just be that you and the person you're assessing agreed what would be an appropriate personalized plan and you chip in to bits of it. But I think um, everything about autism has to take account of that person with autism's world. Just as uh, you're requiring them to take account of your world, so it's a kind of mutual thing. And as Tom said, that world may be very different for different people with autism, even though they have the same condition. So, these are some of the things that would have to be taken into account. I've mentioned several of them. Um, I'll just pick out a few. Ruminations and PTSD. One big problem for people with autism who become socially isolated, as many do, is that they start to ruminate about things. They start to ruminate about things in order to set things right in their mind. Lots of people with autism think a lot in that way. Um, but that can lead to an increasing focus on bad things that have happened to them and a kind of condition that many people with autism now call complex PTSD. And they do have sudden intrusive memories of things that have been said to them or things that uh, happened that they feel are, uh, are wrong and unjustified and so on. So that's a problem that might you might come across as a general psychiatrist um, and might indeed lead to some kind of uh, aggressive behavior or complaining behavior. Um, loneliness, really big problem, the single most difficult psychological issue for adolescents, certainly, um, and may lead to um, people teaming up 
with other people, um, running with the wrong group at school, people sometimes say, um, or people pretending to be something they're not, clowning about at school is another issue that people often talk about. Identification with other marginalized people. Um, so people running off and joining the circus almost, people who find a cult somewhere that they can be part of. Um, and that's fine, often, but it can lead to other people being critical or problems with family members. And I mentioned inf information download uh, already. Um, eccentricity being laughed, that's fine too, but it may lead to people being laughed at or excluded as adults. And that's another uh, very painful issue for many people with autism, um, who sometimes tend to get locked in at home for that reason. Um, the commonest activities for people in Sheffield were going to the cinema and, gosh, I can't remember the second one, and going to the cinema, of course, is a wonderful place where you don't have to speak to anybody, where you can't be seen. Oh, yes, going to the library, of course, and you don't have to interact. Um, it was kind of sad thing to make into your most common activity. So, and of course, psychotic-like experiences are always um, an issue that uh, sometimes preoccupy general psychiatry teams or community mental health teams for quite a while. Um, these are mainly tied up with impaired social interaction. Of course, restricted or repetitive activity uh, is another issue. Um, not getting ready on time because you're checking that you've got everything uh, sorted out. Big problem for families when dad's never ready to leave on time um, or is ready three hours ahead of time and then stands pacing around the front door and shouting at people. Um, I haven't had as much uh, success with drug medication as Tom has. Um, so you're, for me, psychological interventions like pacing or, but again, it's often about just working with people um, personally. And anxiety, of course, is a big one. So what's the issue for general psychiatrists? Well, in one study uh, by a well-known team in Sweden, they thought that uh, just under 20% uh, of people presenting to a general psychiatry clinic in Sweden um, had autism. And another 5 to 10% they thought had sub-threshold symptoms, whatever they are. Um, but uh, so autism is an issue that's going to come across for to uh, many of you, uh, and I'm sure you're well aware of that. And there is a correlation between uh, autism and uh, known or I don't you know recognised psychiatric conditions. ADHD, of course, is one. Um, the figures are a bit variable. These are kind of just I put together several groups of figures from other samples. Um, panic disorder is not uncommon. Uh, depression, well, that's probably not dissimilar to the uh, rate in the general population, but of course it depends on what you mean by depression these days, because uh, it seems that depression and anxiety have become rather mixed up. OCD, that's probably twice as common or maybe three times as common as in the general population, and that's OCD over and above uh, ritualistic behavior. Substance misuse, a um, bit more higher perhaps than you expect, but well below the, the general population number. Somatoform disorders, very difficult to treat. And of course, um, an increase in bipolar disorder and in brief psychosis, in fact, it's very, unusual to find the kinds of uh, brief psychoses in the general population that you see in autism, such as catatonia. I don't think many of us see catatonia except in people with autism. But I'm talking about somebody who is in a clinic uh, 
which is specialized in autism and has a lot of people coming along saying, have I got autism? It's much harder being in a general psychiatry clinic, I think, and seeing people who come along because they've got anxiety disorder and saying, ah, oh, but maybe there's autism here. Um, I used to have general psychiatry clinics and autism assessment clinics, and I used to find that there was so very and psychotherapy assessments, and I used to find that it was really hard to think of autism when I was doing general psychiatry or psychotherapy assessments. Um, easier, actually, when I was in an autism clinic to pick up psychiatric disorder. So, what does it look like if you are seeing people with um, anxiety and you want to think about autism too, or you start to suspect it? Well, or you, well, you've got to look at these two things. So, what does that mean? Well, how would you know somebody had impaired social communication? People are going to conceal that, and of course, anyway, somebody with autism is might be very shut down. They might look at the floor. They might avoid you looking in your eyes. So. The usual cues that says, you know, this person might have autism are not there. So you might pick up the fact they have psychosocial difficulties as a result of their impaired nonverbal communication. For example, never having had a friend or not really knowing what a friend is, that might be a cue. If they're a stickler for timing or they have particular ways of doing things, or when you're asking them questions, they aren't particularly clear about what you're asking and come back with more questions of you, then that might be a clue too. Should you make a diagnosis of autism? Should you then be expected to make an assessment as a general psychiatrist or maybe as a forensic psychiatrist, you probably should. I don't, I think that's moot. I think what really matters is that you're aware that this person may have some kind of psychosocial difficulty and that you're then motivated, as is your team, uh, to provide them with an autistic friendly environment. Um, and actually it is of course a requirement of the Quality Act that you do so. Uh, I'm always a bit bothered that the GMC, if they're, doing a health investigation of a doctor with autism never realizes that the Equality Act requires them or requires the NHS to provide an autism friendly environment for that doctor. So what you need to do is to provide a bridge then between their world and our world or the neurotypical world. Remembering what Tom said that if you're a neurodivergent person, they don't think they may not think their world is defective, although you want to go in and help them to change. Um, and they don't necessarily think that your world is better either. They don't actually feel that it's necessary for them to change. So, and it may be true that somebody with autism who has learning difficulties, intellectual difficulties, may similarly not feel that they need to change or uh, may not be particularly motivated to change. Sorry about this. I've never quite got used to these Bluetooth mice. So what does that mean? So it might mean that you want to avoid challenging behavior or complaints or difficulties or, uh, you know, breakages in the relationship, the therapeutic relationship between you and the person with autism. There are various ways of thinking about that. I, I work a bit with an organization called AG Autism, which has just been part of a, a health education sponsored training program. I don't, maybe even some of you have gone on it, um, about how to provide an autism friendly environment, mainly looking at how one is oneself about how you respond. Um, they're very keen on thinking fast and thinking slow. So thinking slow is the, what we used to call count to 10 before you do anything. Um, but you might say, well, 
you know, this is all very well. I've got lots and lots of demands on my time. I've always got the managers breathing down my neck about this or that's the other thing, or uh, I'm really pressured. So I think one way of thinking about it is that it's a bit like peanut allergy. You know, many years ago, nobody thought anybody had peanut allergy. Now everybody seems, not everybody of course, but I mean, a lot of people seem to have it and we need to take it into account because actually some people have a very severe reaction to peanuts. So maybe once upon a time, we could just say autism, not for us, hope, hope it goes away. But now we have to accept it, A, it won't go away. Um, and B, sometimes if we get things wrong, there can be quite serious consequences for the person with autism in how we behave. That might be um, one of the analogies they gave on this training was how a pathway I gave them about the escalation for a person with autism who was admitted to a general psychiatry ward and ended up a week later in a, a prison uh, a local prison where he remained for some considerable time, all because uh, things going wrong between him and the ward environment. So how do we create a friendly environment? Well, uh, various links, here's a checklist. Uh, sorry about that. Let's practice with these mice a bit more. So no, um, but I think the big thing is to avoid bullying and exploitation. And these are both problems on wards and uh, day patient environments and day centers and so on, anywhere where people get together. There are big problems in schools um, and uh, they're problems that are mainly overlooked because they're so intractable perhaps, or because we don't believe they could be happening. Um, but, and we don't believe our staff could be bullying or even us could be bullying, but, you know, if you're in a different place in your world, um, one can see things very differently. Um, so I think I need to rush on. So this is a bit about bullying. So what about specific interventions? So NICE mentions group, group social skills training, for example, um, group training for employment skills. I don't know where they got these suggestions from, to be honest. If you look at um, the research evidence for psychosocial interventions for the core impairment in autism, which is what NICE was referring to, Study after study, this is just a small group of studies, say that there is no definite evidence for one particular intervention being better than another. Um, so does that mean we should just be, um, you know, wash our hands of any kind of social, psychosocial intervention except to be aware of the impact of our own treatment uh, facilities, our own systems, our own mental health uh, organizations on people with autism. Well, there is some evidence for the value of treating internalizing disorders, that is anxiety and depression. Um, so at least in adults, um, perhaps the first priority should be once a person has had a diagnosis and received and not necessarily provided by a general psychiatry team unless you've wanted to specialize in that way which would be great um, incidentally we offer a, a, a master's course in autism and autism assessment if anybody's interested um, but at least um, provide some kind of help for people with anxiety disorders that is congruent with autism. So provided by somebody who knows about autism and in an autism friendly environment. And that does seem to help. 
And maybe, as Tom said, it actually helps the manifestations of autism because however we try and understand it, um, the impairment of autism, maybe we should call it the handicap, um, does go up and down. It goes up, of course, when people are anxious or uncertain or lonely, and it goes down when they feel more confident, more empowered. Um, so treating anxiety or depression or obsessional symptoms that are upsetting other people and, and coming back on the person with autism, those are well worth doing, even in adulthood. It doesn't really matter if you're changing the fundamental issues in autism. Obviously, that's a much more important hope in children, and there is evidence that, um, for example, applied behavior analysis, which a lot of people dislike because of its, its origins, but there is evidence of that and pivot training and things that actually focus on specific issues um, that can be changed. Um, they, they may well change the core impairment for some people and allow more normal development or more neurotypical developmental uh, trajectory. Um, but they work because they're repeated, they're focused on particular aspects and they're person, personalized. They work for one child, they're developed for one child. Um, so these ideas that you can just sit people down in a group and talk about the difficulties of socializing, um, I don't think they work. Peer support works better. Advocacy is an, a useful thing, uh, supporting people accessing health services or dealing with challenge, for example, getting benefit if they uh, are disabled by the autism. But oddly enough, and it's a surprise to me too, psychotherapy or counseling and coaching are particularly helpful. So what's required there. So entering the other person's world, I've mentioned the world a lot. Um, I don't have time to go into it, but I think it's a fascinating area, this concept of intersubjectivity. And if any of you are as fascinated as me, I wrote a book called uh, The Interbrain about this because I was so fascinated. People with autism often live a lot in the past, either trying to sort things out or make things look different um, because they regret the past or because they idealize the past. So uh, especially in people with um, intellectual disability, commemoration of the past is a very important part of their lives, I think, and one has to be aware of that and respect it. Um, provide predictability, um, and some kind of narrative. Lots of people with autism deal with plans and visualization better than words. So providing some kind of explanation in terms of pictures, uh, social stories, as my colleagues in child and adolescent psychiatry will know have been very successful for people with younger children, especially those with intellectual difficulties. And that's because you can't assume that somebody with autism just knows what's going to happen. Um, because they don't just know. They're fairly impervious to what's sometimes called common sense, but is actually a kind of social um, intuition provided through social interaction uh, and modeling. So they need to supplement that with their own narrative and you can help with that. Um, be aware that anxiety and frustration mount up, but may be completely uh, invisible until they explode out. Um, and don't assume that a lack of social interaction uh, means people don't want to socialize. It just means perhaps that people have given up. And peer support, very important. Uh, I haven't really addressed language impairment or ritualistic behavior in terms of specifics about social. Oops, gosh, I need to tell you this. 
So my discovery in the last few years is that coaching is an extremely effective intervention. Now, you all know about coaching because it's become, you know, the thing. The more senior you are in your organisation, the more likely you are to be offered coaching. So that's executive coaching. What I'm talking about is something sometimes called life coaching, where you take the same kind of general view that um, there are problems that get in people's way to leading a full life. So you're not interested in so much in their emotional lives. You're interested in looking at what stops them solving these particular problems. So we've had people whose problems have been hallucinations, suicidal thoughts, uh, believing that their thighs are becoming feminine. Um, well, I won't go on. And they are susceptible to this kind of unflappable coaching approach, it seems. And it's often combined with what's sometimes called myutics or the Socratic method or what was for a while called a philosophical counselling where you just ask people what would happen if or by what they've just said does that mean the following and you do that rather nasty method that Plato ascribed to Socrates in which he gradually takes his friends and skewers them with his apparently harmless questions and of course you don't skewer people but you help them to be clearer about the assumptions that they make uh, for example, about other people um, being horrible. Uh, and unfortunately, we can be. So I'm, I'm done. And uh, I'll stop my sharing and hope I've left time for questions. I got rather carried away, though, so I apologise to Isham. Thank you very much, Dickie. That was very interesting. Um, we have a few questions, and in the interest of time, I'll just pick a short one, and I'm sure Professor Digby will be happy to respond to the rest via email, perhaps. Sure. Um, um, is there a screening tool that you would recommend to be used in general adult um, communities, well, general adult world setting, to screen for ASD when suspected? Uh, there is. There are many. The one that's recommended by NICE, I'm afraid most of us feel is not effective. It's not accurate. Um, but there are, uh, there are others and um, I'd be happy to, uh, to you know, make recommendations. Um, but, you know, like most things in psychiatry, we we'll do much better when we use our own interactive abilities rather than using questionnaires. Um, and I don't think that many general psychiatrists will require to be diagnosing. I think what, what we need is for general psychiatrists to have a network of people they can ask to make a diagnosis or can make a diagnostic assessment. Um, on the basis of suspicion. So I think it's enough when we suspect, uh, suspect something and pass people on, but when we suspect something that will often mean, as I said, that that person will need to have particular attention paid to their respect for their world, which may be different from ours. And that's in some ways, I think the most important psychosocial intervention, we just have to be aware that we need to reach out to that person in some way or change our behavior or change the way we do things in order to make that bridge with their, with their world. And I think it doesn't matter if we do that too often with people who actually don't have autism. As soon as we just feel that there's something different about this person, I think we could, we could do that without too much of a cost to our time or effort. Thank you very much for your answer. And thank you very much for that interesting and very um, um, thought-provoking uh, okay. talk. Well, thank you. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so now we are, well, scheduled for a break. So um, please, uh, all of you stay tuned. We have more uh, topics and more uh, talks uh, for today. Please be back by 11.25 um, and we will 
will be here for you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this talk, uh, Haishim, and uh, um, to this illustrious uh, lineup of speakers. When Rafi asked me what I'd like to speak on, uh, I said I'd like to speak on something that I know best, which is secure care. And I've worked with uh, secure, in secure care with adolescents with autistic spectrum disorder for the best part of 15 years now. And uh, I'm just going to bring you a very clinical presentation, which is titled Notes from the Frontline. Karen, can I have the first slide, please? The slide is titled just a normal little weird kid. And this is the description that was given of the young man by his father. And this is a description that any of us could be writing down as notes or come across in an outpatient clinic dealing with young people with autistic spectrum disorder. He did not talk till the age of three. He was hypersensitive to touch. He spent hours playing at two Lego tables. And as Tom said earlier on, he kept practicing facial expressions in the mirror. And his father's description was that he was more likely to be victimized than act in a violent way against another. Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? He described how much he liked being a young kid. And he had a middle of the road uh, childhood. There was nothing very different about him compared to any other child that you'd come across. And he had difficulties in secondary school, which is very similar to most of the people with autistic spectrum disorder. And the only notable thing that happened to him in adolescence was that his parents split up. They seemed to get along very well uh, between themselves, but he then came to live with his mother and because of all the problems at school, mother looked into homeschooling. And in fact, the mother was advised against homeschooling because of the significant risk it would create for Adam, even with the best of intentions, in creating what the expert called a prosthetic environment, which spares him having encounters with other students or work to overcome such social difficulties. And the only thing that was unusual uh, in secondary school was Adam wrote this big book of granny in which an old woman goes around with a gun in her cane and wantonly killing people. In the third chapter, the granny and the son want to taxidermy a boy for their mantelpiece. The teacher who read this piece found the piece so disturbing that she refused to let Adam publish it. And this is a description not of Adam, but of his father, made by a reporter from the New Yorker who said that he maintains a fa nearly fanatical insistence on fact, and he doesn't think that the catastrophe could have been predicted. And the catastrophe was actually, can I have the next slide, please, Karen? The catastrophe that the father couldn't predict or anybody couldn't predict, depending on whom you ask, was the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootout. There were 20 children killed and six teachers. And depending on whom you ask, there were 26 victims, 27 including Nancy, Adam's mother, whom he killed before he went out on the shooting spree. Or if you are generous enough to include Adam himself and his various difficulties, there would be 28 victims because Adam killed himself after the event. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so I hasten to add, this is not a normal scenario, and this doesn't happen to most people with autistic spectrum disorder or even most adolescents. But we are all agreed, and most of us who have been an adolescent or have lived with an adolescent will agree that adolescents are very, very different. And adolescents are different because they have very plastic brains and sometimes plastic need not be that fantastic. And if you are on a trajectory that is uh, for wellness, then the plastic is fantastic. But if the trajectory is not one of wellness, then the plastic actually becomes so that 
all the risk factors actually meld with each other and the complex comorbidities work against each other. They are also very sensitive to environmental influences, including the ones in the family, the ones in school, the ones in peer groups, and this all pulls together to create a dom domino effect. Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? So the million dollar question, does having an autistic spectrum disorder confer vulnerability to having criminal tendencies? Most of the people I have worked with don't don't actually start out by having any criminal tendencies whatsoever. But how everybody who is anybody in autism has weighed in to propose what could increase uh, the risks for people with autistic spectrum disorder. Howland proposed that the increased social naivete might leave people with autistic spectrum disorder open to manipulation by others. Their desire to have let have friends have let some autistic people be befriended by criminals and become unwitting accomplices. Autistic people often do not understand other people's motives. A disruption of the routines or over rigid adherence to rules might lead people with autistic spectrum disorder being a aggressive. For in example, an unexpected changes in the environment and routine, a delay in public transport may cause great anxiety and distress, leading to aggressive behavior. A lack of understanding of social situations and poor negotiating skills can be also responsible. An obsessional interest might lead someone to committing an offense in pursuit of that interest. It is perhaps also exacerbated by a failure to recognize the implications of their behaviors. And it, this could be argued in the case of Garrett McKinnon, whom we will talk about later. So Lorna Wing herself talked about the low levels of empathy in people with ASD, which might contribute the likelihood of offense. There are several studies which it that an impaired theory of mind, poor emotional regulations and problem with moral reasoning may risk the risk of an offence. For instance, if you remember John T. Bravery, the gentleman who threw a young lad off the balcony in Tate Modern, told the police that he carried out the attack because he wanted to be on the news. He told the police that he had a pro point to prove to every idiot who said he had no mental health problems. The first question he asked the police was whether the incident was going to be on the news. Most chillingly, he said, I wanted to be on the news, who I am and why I did that. So when it's official, no one can say anything else. And this raises the question of whether his lack of understanding of other people and his poor emotional regulation led to such a big act. However, there are distinct differences between psychopathy and autistic spectrum disorders, which have often been conflated because appropriate social interaction difficulties are characteristic of both children with autism and children with callous and unemotional traits, which predisposes to psychopathy. There's often an ability to lack of ability to empathize or affiliate with others. However, most experts agreed that despite some superficial overlaps, the two are distinct. Most children with autistic spectrum disorders have difficulty intuiting other people's thoughts, beliefs and intentions. However, they show intact responses, suggesting that their basic reactivity is preserved. Children with callous and unemotional traits, on the other hand, appear to have very good insight into other people's mental states as measured by theory of mind task, but lack concern for other people's feeling. So children with autism know, but don't know, but care. But and children with callous and unemotional traits know, but do not care. And this is consistent with behavioral and neuroimaging studies that report separate cognitive and neural correlates of these profiles. Are there differences in gender? Autism, as we've heard, can be a male typical disorders, and it's very obvious uh, here, as in uh, most criminal justice system, that males tend to have the more externalizing issues, uh, including conduct problems, whereas females have more internalizing issues. 
Eight of the 11 cases described by Canon, all the four cases described by Asperger's were male. Prevalent surveys conducted since have reported a range of male biases from 1.3 in 1 to 15.1, the common consensus being about 4 to 1. Males with ASD are found to show more externalizing behavior problems similar to most males. And this can include aggressive behaviors, hyperreactivity, reduced prosocial behaviors, and the increase in the repetitive and restricted behaviors may also contribute to these difficulties. Interestingly, the detentions under the Mental Health Act are greater with greater in females and it seems very likely that females end, end up in hospitals and males end up within other parts of the criminal justice system. So what are the different types of offenses that are commit by, committed by people with autistic spectrum disorder? Chile in the largest study in 2012 said crimes against people rather than property were characteristic of young people without, with autistic spectrum disorder. They were also more significantly, not surprisingly, more involved in school disturbances, but surprisingly less often involved in probation violence, probation violations, which can be attributed to their ability to actually pick up on rules and stick with them. In another study, Siponima in 2001 said 15% of the patients had pervasive developmental disorder and 3% had Asperger's syndrome when they surveyed a young offenders population in Sweden. Leddingham and Mills have suggested different types of offences. Sexual offences are also greater because of impaired and problematic sexual development. These include inappropriate courtship scripts, exposing one's genitals, touching others in a sexual manner, and also downloading child pornography. Again, fire setting has been frequently associated with people with developmental disabilities, which includes uh, learning disabilities and people with autistic spectrum disorder. And another characteristic via act which has been described is obsessive harassment. Lindsay relieved that compared to neurotypical individuals, autistic per spectrum disorder had higher per percentage of stalking almost four times, 8.5 versus 2.8 percent, and a generally an increase in all non-contact sexual offences rather than contact se sexual offences. We all know in 2001, British computer hacker Gary McKinnon was accused of hacking 97 US military and NASA computers. He denied any malicious intent and he claimed to be looking for UFO activities. He was arrested by the high Tech crime unit in London and subsequently indicted in the USA on seven counter computer crime. It was very typical that McKinnon appealed the extradition request and the subsequent publicity, the possibility of autism was raised and he was in fact diagnosed with autism during the course of this proceedings. This exemplifies the extreme egocentricity, pursuit of special interest, coupled with poor self-monitoring and impulse control that's characteristic of people involved in cyber crimes. This may be aggravated by comorbid psychiatric disorders. This really isn't helped by impaired verbal and non-verbal understanding and social naivet. Unlike other offenders, cyber offenders seldom fill a recognized criminal profile, committing crimes not for monetary gain, but for recognition, adulation, or self-satisfaction. Often described in police reports as loners or odd, they are reported to come across less frequently from so lower socioeconomic groups, which is atypical in the criminal justice setting. There are various classifications of stalking and number of stalking typologies have been proposed. There have been some suggestions that the possible association of the link between ASD and stalking behavior is that some of these are directed in a very sexual sense, but may actually involve an attraction to a person, fixation on body parts, or an obsession with pornography. Such behaviors may increase the 
risk of the individual engaging in stalking behaviors or sexual advances which are not reciprocated. This can come from the fact that ASD individuals crave and persistently seek out intimacy, yet lack social competence to initiate relationships. Reviewing all of this literature, the point that I'd like to emphasize as a take home message is actually is a autistic spectrum disorder itself does not lead to higher rates of offending. However, autistic spectrum disorder with comorbid illness does. We should look at the comorbid illnesses in a minute. Not unsurprisingly, similar to everywhere else in the criminal justice and secure care, high levels of social deprivation increases the offending risk, except for cyber crimes. Life events, mood disturbances, poor emotional coping all contribute to offending. People with diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder are not more likely to commit crimes, but it's very noteworthy that they overrepresented within the criminal justice system. So how does this happen? There are lots of theories around this. It is said that unfortunately people with autistic spectrum disorder are perceived unfavorably in adjudicative proceedings and this results in har harsher pen penalty. It might be because of the way they present their lack of empathy and their poor theory of mind coming across as a lack of remorse. But whatever the case may be, ASD offenders receive longer sentences compared to others on the national sentencing data. Sentencing data from Australian Bureau of, of Statistics were used to compare offenders with non with with or without ASD and offenders with ASD attracted longer sentences across all offense classification, particularly in relation to sexual crime. At index conviction, ASD offenders were also tended to be overrepresented in sex crime with a child victim. So what what are the comorbid conditions that leads them to commit these crimes? The most frequent comorbidity and early comorbidity is with ADHD, almost 40%. Association with anxiety disorders and oppositional disorders also impacts hugely because of the lack of social adjustments at this age. When Harriman and his colleagues looked at the increased risk of offending amongst individuals with ASD, when ADHD and CD were controlled, conduct disorder were controlled for, the relationship between ASC and crime completely disappeared, which is very notable. Unfortunately, these are people who have enormity of de developmental trauma, especially if they come from a low, low socioeconomic strata. And this leads to a range of attachment disorders and moving from place to place does not make for stable representative relationships. Unfortunately, they often get into substance misuse to get in with a peer group uh, when they read uh, adolescence. This might lead to brain injury in itself or pre predisposed to road traffic accidents, a range of other brain injuries, which again complicates the issues. At this point of time, they also are more likely to have depressive disorders psychotic disorders and other mental illnesses. Other developmental disorders are also associated with this. So what is it to be a person with an autistic spectrum disorder? A young man had described it to me as being a legal alien, that he looks like everybody else, but he seems to be living somebody else's story. And in this Often in secure care, offence becomes central to the individual, but the offence is not a standalone event. It is not a coincidence. It's often affected by the presence of other disorders that we talked about. It's presented by the fact that they're unable to communicate their wants and needs. They're unable to communicate their real desire to get to know people. They have other deficits uh, in the theory of mind, which makes it difficult for them to understand uh, people. Their primary relationships are often warped when they are people who are predisposed to secure care. 
and various environmental influences like uh, a pro-criminal peer group or even a pro-criminal family does not really help matters. So if you look at how many children are detained in secure care, to date, 1,465 children are securely detained, out of which 873 are in the youth justice system, 505 are in mental health, and 87 are within secure homes. Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? But there is some good news at, and some light at the end of this tunnel because the number of young people in the secure estates have steadily decreased even as I've been practicing, which is really good news. In January 2022, the overall population of the secure estate for children and young people, including those aged 18 years, was 502. This was actually a decrease from the previous year, and it's very, very notable to compare it with the figures in 2009-10, which was almost four times that amount. So what, what are the type of secure establishments? There are three main types of secure establishments outside of the medical system, which is the young offenders institutions, the secure training centers, and the local authority children's home. The key commissioners for each of these secure establishments are different, and the number of staff to young patient ratio can wildly differ. The young offender institutions are the largest and the biggest with the poorest staff ratios, which can range in a good facility from 1 to 10 and in a rather busy large facility to 1 in 60. Secure training centers are managed by the Youth Justice Board and the staff to young persons ratio can be anywhere between 3 to 8. And a local authority secure homes are the best of the slot and the, they have very high staff ratios and they can look after sentenced uh, young people, people on remand and those with welfare who have secure needs. They're usually admitted to these secure establishments under particularly the local authority secure homes and secure training centres under the Children Act, uh, Section 25 rather than the Mental Health Act. There are five young offenders institutions, three secure training centres and 14 local authority secure homes across the country. However, particularly in when children with autistic spectrum disorder, the, the Children's Commissioners have raised the question of children who are held outside the secure state under conditions that uh, amount to deprivation of liberty, whom they've called the invisible, invisible children. And that is very pertinent, particularly for people with autistic spectrum disorders. So what's the difficulty with custodial environments in autistic spectrum disorders? It's very likely that people with autistic spectrum disorder became become targets for physical harm, ridicule and bullying, manipulation by other inmates. They may also have difficulty adhering to prison culture, for examples in not ratting on inmates, leading to physical altercations. Those with autistic spectrum disorders may also have difficulty following directions or complying with prison regimes, leading to disciplinary reports. So they end up having more confrontation than usual with both staff and with inmates. They find restriction of items, particularly electronic items, very, very difficult. And the levels of noise in most of these facilities can add to their difficulties. The staff training and awareness in these facilities can be extremely patchy. So does it get better with health facilities? for young people with autistic spectrum disorder. Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? Unfortunately, uh, not. Health provisions with adults with forensic needs, though I know my secure colleagues will protest about it. For adults, there are plenty of provisions available. They follow a reasonably linear trajectory and they have services from a whole range of facilities, including CMHTs, PQs, 
inpatient units. There are a whole lot of outreach and community forensic teams. And the secure care follows a sensible trajectory from low, medium to high secure with a very identified set of conditions and trajectories. Unfortunately, it all seems to disappear with adolescents. Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? Provisions for adolescents, there are no high secure services, fortunately for adolescents. The maximum degree of security is medium secure, which incidentally is about four times as expensive as a prison setting. There are secure un low secure units into which some of the young people from medium secure can step down or people can be admitted into the community. All the people in secure services necessarily have a forensic history, whereas people in low secure services can be a complex mix of risks to themselves and to others. In children, some of these facilities can be provided with inpatient adolescent units which have HDU provisions. It can come from residential provisions and it can also come from adult units and families, which is very, very surprising. In terms of secure establishments, there are about 146 low secure beds across 11 wards and 71 medium secure beds and 138 PQ beds. The cheapest of these provisions are the specialist HDUs and the most expensive and incidentally with the longest length of stay were the medium secure services. In total, there are 28 secure hospitals in England, 16 of which were run by independent providers and 12 by the NHS. At eye watering, 309 million is spent on 1,483 children. A bed in an MSU is three times more expensive and needed to be used well. So what are the kind of difficulties encountered uh, within secure care provisions for young people? Obviously, as we have seen, the provisions are highly limited and need, there's a huge backlog and difficulties both with entry and exit out of these systems. There's a very high level of unassessed need before they come into secure care. Unfortunately for young people, there's a disconnect between the levels of security that uh, alluded to you earlier. And for most part, it's service led rather than needs led approach, which means that there are no autism specialist secure care provisions for young people, which may make life very difficult for them. There's a lack of defined care pathways and trajectories and defined outcomes. So what are the guiding principles? The guiding principles are a distinct specialist secure estate for children and young people, which surprisingly does not mention children with autistic spectrum disorder and people with autistic spectrum disorder are very different from people with intellectual disability are very different from people without any of these neurodevelopmental difficulties. So the strategy for the secure estate identified children as a seemingly homogeneous group, which they're not. So what do we look for when we're looking for good care? Can I have the next slide, please, Karen? It's fairly simple and it amounts to what you would do for most adolescents, which is safety, which becomes even more important for people who are in secure care. Welfare, which includes education and actual progress, which includes the things that they can do with their spare time, the things that they do for recreation, social uh, and family setups become very important in people with autistic spectrum disorder. So if you are looking at treatment options for people with autistic spectrum disorder, it can look something like this. So are there models of care available? There are a huge number of models available. I'm not even expecting anyone to read that very dense slide. I'm just, I've just put it on so that uh, we get an idea of just how many different models of care is available. And all of them seem to work, but none of them have a huge amount of evidence base. 
and most systems use some part of it and most used hybrid models. One of the biggest difficulties in secure care is point of transitions. These can be developmental transitions from being a young person to being an adult, which can occur inside the secure state or a child might actually step out into the brave new world when they turn into an adult. It can happen at the end of clinical endpoints. It can also happen between levels of security as people transition between medium to low secure to locked rehabilitation to a range of other services. And sometimes these transitions can happen from specialists to generic services. For instance, children can move from a secure unit to a general adolescent service or a rehabilitation setting. All of these transitions, no matter what type they are, in children with autistic spectrum disorder involve a huge leap of faith because they move from higher levels of support and they move to seemingly greater independence, which unfortunately may not be the best thing for some of these young people. And more importantly, for people with autistic spectrum disorder, they move to a very loose structure, which after the rigors of more secure care can come as an unpleasant surprise to some of them. Unfortunately, systems don't help either. There are differences in nosology. Most of my unfortunate uh, young people on the 18th birthday usually get a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder or a range of personality disorders as their birthday present. And there's a sudden shift from families and people and systems to a very person-centered approach, which some of the young people are completely not used to and some of the families find very disturbing. There might be differences in the way philosophies of the service is structured. Sometimes there's even a lack of common language, though that is increasingly becoming more of less of an issue now. For instance, uh, previously ADHD was not a commonly recognized comorbidity that people went forward. It meant difficulties in obtaining treatment for what's very what's a very treatable conditions. They've attracted a lot of buzzwords, which one wishes are a part of the life and the journey of any young person through secure care, particularly one with autistic spectrum disorder. Continuity of care, flexibility of boundary, information exchange, all seem to be very, very vital to young people. And outcome measures are important in linking outcomes to trajectories of care. They're important to determine future directions and future research. And they need to happen across a range of outcome measures, such as clinical measures, the ones that look at reoffending and actual social measures to see how the young people have done. For most people, can I have the next slide, please, Karen? For most people, it is a very long journey, both coming into low secure care and coming out of it, which is why outcome measures become doubly important. So I've come to the end of my presentation and I I should be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your patient listen. Professor Mike Kerr. Hello, will give us a talk Hello. about uh, epilepsy and developmental disorder. Professor Kerr is a clinical professor emeritus in Cardiff University Department of Psychological Medicine and Clinical Neurosciences and honorary professor in Swansea University. His clinical practice is in epilepsy associated with intellectual disability and in the assessment and treatment of epilepsy and psychiatric disorders. 
Uh, without further ado, over to you, Professor Kerr. Right. Um, well, I'll just get if I can share the screen. Um, and just put it on to presentation. That always takes a couple of minutes. But it's, anyway, while we're waiting for my very slow, oh, great. Okay, so um, my great pleasure to talk to you today. I'm just um, getting my head around the timing. Um, I have to do some mental maths. So this is a, a, it's a great, I'm very honored to be asked to speak and for uh, Professor Faruqi, uh, a good friend of mine who I haven't seen for some time to invite me to this really interesting day. And it's been a very interesting to, day today. And uh, if if my um, sound is, is not successful, please do let me know because there's no way I can uh, judge that from here. This is a big topic area. And before I start, I want to say that I'd like to dedicate my presentation today to Professor Bill Fraser. He was a my mentor and many other people's mentor, and he died. He passed in the last uh, month or so. There he is at the front of this um, uh, little group of people in Hong Kong when we went to do some lectures in the in the 90s. Uh, he was a huge advocate for people with autism, neurodevelopmental disorder, neuropsychiatric disorder, and um, really is responsible for much of the advancements in terms of the Welsh policy. And the Welsh services. So this is a uh, to Bill, right? So we've heard epilepsy mentioned a few times in today's uh, interesting lectures, and that, of course, sends a little shiver up my spine, wondering, am I going to talk about white today? And I'm what I the angle I've taken for this presentation is to just try and raise some themes that are important to psychiatrists of any ill. Uh, when coming across a person with epilepsy, I'm um, very aware that the, the range of experience in epilepsy is extremely wide for psychiatrists, and um, and the nature of their practices varies as well. I suppose not unlike autism, and uh, that's been well described by others speak. If I have a learning objective, which I may or may not meet, it is that to help people understand the complexity of the formulation of a management plan, for psychological ill health in a person with epilepsy, disability, developmental disorder. I'm a, I'm a learning disability, intellectual disability specialist, so I've worked a lot in all sorts of you know, psychiatry and, um, and with a lot with autism and epilepsy. So uh, epilepsy, you know, really the basic skills are the same for any person and any human being you meet. And it's all about the uh, adaptation to that person, which I think is probably a uh, good thing about for any approach to neurodevelopment. So let's crack on and see how, where we get to. As psychiatrists, you will come across people with epilepsy being out psychiatrists, or based psychiatrists, without mental psychiatrists, or be psychiatrists, whatever your field. And a common feeling, I think, is that, um, certainly from the neurological perspective, is that this. Epilepsy can be a bit of a confuser in psychiatric practice. And it can make it hard to just develop and apply the skills you normally have to this population. That's the psychiatric skills. And um, I think this is true because epilepsy confuses and epilepsy and its treatment confuses. And it's a whole new condition to know about. Obviously, it's central for those working in intellectual disability but relevant to all psychiatrists. We remember um, many, many years ago, psychiatry and epilepsy were intimately linked. In fact, far too closely linked. And um, much of the problems we have now in putting the two together was the sense that epilepsy was a psychiatric disorder, which it is not. It just has psychiatric disorders associated with it. And when we think about the person in front of us, well, the first thing that will come to mind probably is your own personal skills in epilepsy. Are you a Diagnoser, manager, trainer. Um, then, of course, like everything in psychiatry, it's all about formulation and it's all about the person. So, we need to think about risk factors related to epilepsy, which might affect the presentation of psychiatric disorder. Um, and this is specifically complicated in people with 
learning to go through our developmental disorder. Um, we need to be able to assess the impact, assess impact of treatment, and assess treatment options. And I will address some of these issues in this uh, presentation today. But I'm going to come to this from an epileptology perspective, because whilst I'm a professor of psychiatry, my practice is really that of epilepsy in this population, which causes a huge psychiatric overload to it. You're all psychiatrists, so you know an awful lot about treating epilepsy disorder. Um, so this is a, and I will have um, evidence-based slides, of course, but I also will have a personal view. And this is my personal view about assessing psychiatric disorder association with epilepsy, people with anybody with epilepsy, but in particular people with complex neurodevelopmental or neurological or neuropsychiatric problems. And that it is a special skill set. And this is um, one of the sort of complexities of the situation is that this the psychiatrist who may have well probably is likely to not have the neurological knowledge of the neurologist, the epileptic treatment knowledge of the neurologist. When they meet the person with uh, epilepsy sees them, sees a much more complicated sort of epilepsy to work out. Problems, behavior problems, perhaps, issues related to autism. So, this special skill set, but it is a skill set that can be held by one individual, it can be held by a team of professionals, patients, carers, the family, uh, and it needs time. Uh, it's not the place for rapid um, judgmental decision making, it's a time for thinking um, and it needs decision making what it doesn't need is um, no action well, wherever your place is in this you may be an uh, an opener of doors for the driver access better psychiatric illness or to liaise with neurological uh, services so what you need to do this and what your team needs to do is, is a high knowledge of epilepsy knowledge of diagnosis without being a diagnostic, investigation, treatment, treatment side effects, high level of experience of seizure change assessment, high level knowledge of the known facts about epilepsy behavior, psychological illness, and ability to adapt the known facts to developmental disorder because studies within this population are not as big a part of the evidence as the actual evidence basis. Higher level knowledge of psychiatric illness and its treatment, High level knowledge of psychiatric disorders and people with intellectual disability, including challenging behaviors, autism, and all the broader areas of developmental disability. Good knowledge of genetics, reliable, efficient means of gathering information on the individual. Seems like quite a lot, but I do say it is part of the team. But I think it's part of the, my reason for saying this is to recognize that when that person sits in front of you, be they a child or an adult, and you see they've got epilepsy, teasing apart the influence of epilepsy will be harder than than there'll be it'll be a challenge here's some broad key points when looking at this population mental illness in people with epilepsy and developmental disorder and people with epilepsy in general is common and be a diagnostic challenge now in some people that is because often miss or misattributing that it is seen as something to do with epilepsy or epilepsy treatment, which may be the case, I'll say it later, is not necessarily the case. And it appears to be often undertreated. And now it may be undertreated because it's not diagnosed, but it may be undertreated because of concerns professionals have that psychiatric treatments, when pharmacological, uh, are contribute to a worsening of epilepsy, and because uh, access to psychological treatment is not that easy. Challenging behavior is a common part of this, of the neuropsychiatric mental spectrum. Um, it is often misattributed to treatment effect or misdiagnosed as epilepsy. And it is in fact over-treated with psychotropic medication. We look at epilepsy itself and psychological disturbance, there is more mental illness, hmm. probably not more challenging behavior or aggression, contrary to popular belief. Uh, and it's important to assess 
this and the treatment effect. So, psychiatric disorder of people in common with epilepsy, and it is no different to people with developmental disorder. Of course, to understand it, we need to apply this to people with developmental disorder. So here's a paper uh, by um, Dr. Rye from the early uh, 2012, looking at the prevalence of epilepsy in, in a large psychiatric cohort. Um, and this is not specific in people with autism. Any depression or anxiety. In the, so I think someone's got their speaker open somewhere because I hear strange noises coming out of my speaker. Fine, um, as long as they're not coming from me. Um, uh, any depression or anxiety prevalence in people with epilepsy is 21.5 to 41%. You shouldn't be surprised that people are depressed with epilepsy. Um, any chronic neurological disorders with a high percentage of depression. This ratios, anxiety disorder, also common. Suicide attempts, lifetime, again, very common. The suicide attempts in the last year, again, very common. So, in fact, in this study, the one psychiatric diagnosis that was more common in people with epilepsy was that of autistic spectrum disorder. So, not a common diagnosis, it was more common uh, compared to other chronic neurological diseases, which have high, high prevalences like this. So psychiatrists will see people with epilepsy and it's not uncommon that they will have psychiatric disorder. That probably a shock piece of news. The world of epilepsy has worked very hard to try and work with the psychiatric world to try and understand what are the specific uh, areas of uh, epilepsy or psychiatric disorder in this population that need a great moment to have something special about them. So this uh, paper we published some time ago, uh, but I think is is still worth uh, worth looking at. It's an international paper looking at clinical practice statements. One of the things it did do, it, it did a, uh, a Delphi technique to find out what conditions were most concerning to neuropsychiatrists and to epileptic doctors in terms of um, uh, psychiatric disorders and in epilepsy. And these were anxiety, psychosis, AED related effects, surgery, children epilepsy, adolescents, psychogenic seizures, Children with ID, suicidality, depression. But all of these happen in epilepsy, and all these have to be then identified and worked with in people with poor communication and all the problems of development disorder were well described by previous speakers. Again, the world of epilepsy takes psychiatric conditions very seriously. And in these uh, roadmap for competency based educational curriculum, Psychiatric issues we include psycho psychogenic seizures as well, and non epileptic, various non epileptic manifestations are, are key areas of proficiency for uh, the neurological or the epileptic world. So, this is an international document, and there's no doubt about it in other countries around the world. Important, like, the link between psychiatry and neurology is closer than it is in the United Kingdom. But demonstrate um, knowledge of cognitive comorbidities, um, recognize psychiatric comorbidities such as autism spectrum disorders, appropriate management of these disorders. So there's a lot of areas where the neurology world is realizing that it needs to understand psychiatry to be able to deliver good neurology. And I think contrary to that is true. So, you have a person in front of you with the neurodevelopmental disorder. You are more expert than me on neurodevelopmental disorders. And you've heard today a lot of the characteristics of those people. What sort of ways do we need to approach our formulation? What traps can we fall into? Well, this is a more, um, this, this is a, a recent uh, a not so recent paper from Nature Reviews of Neurology, looking at a neurobehavioral comorbidities of epilepsy was a network based taxonomy. Sounds very confusing. Actually, this is quite pragmatic and it's something which one can look at when we see anybody with a neurodevelopmental problem and who has a psychiatric comorbidity. And it basically says there are differential factors working on the likelihood of what has caused that condition, some of which may be amenable to our treatment. If we look at this 
suppose the most obvious one is that brain structure and connectivity, which are obvious in many, many people with neurodevelopment disorders, I clearly have a problem with them, influence the development of neurobehavioral comorbidity. And in fact, nature of your brain structural and connectivity problem will influence it in different ways. Comorbid somatic disease and medical risk will also influence the development of comorbidity, psychiatric comorbidity. And um, particularly important in those with uh, learning disability who have very high rates of comorbid other uh, medical conditions are not always identified. And I'm sure the same is true for the autistic population where the individual's ability to present their physical health to health professionals can lead to an underdiagnosis of concurrent morbidity. A lot of epilepsy factors affect the development of neurobehavioral problems, which I'll discuss a bit later. Genomic risk and genomic resilience affect this, and this is an increasing area of interest, which I think can actually influence practice. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Resilience factors are important, obviously, having an occupation, fitness, family support, all these things can affect things. And then your so social and psychological risk. So I think the concept that you have a neurodevelopmental problem or you have a learning disability and you just get challenging behavior or you just get anxious uh, has become far more complicated and individual assessment has become uh, key. Let's look at some of the genetic causation. I want to thank Christopher Eaton for this for his work he did when he was at the MRC uh, Center in Cardiff. Um, I've had to take out one of my parts of this because it's response to V in terms of uh, weight. Um, so this looked at one condition, uh, chromosome 23Q deletion, well known to psychiatrists as it is the condition that uh, has been uh, probably one of the most investigated to look at its association with um, psychiatric disease because of the high risk of psychosis. Really. 25 to 30. And uh, Christopher looked at the importance of epilepsy in this population and also looked at over, uh, overlying features related to comorbidity. So, whilst you won't always come across a person with chromosome 22, it is an example of how, if you do know someone has a genetic condition, of course, common people with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, that may influence your formulation. Epilepsy in this population is a prevalence of 4 to 37 percent, or is almost certainly uh, an example of underdiagnosis. So, epileptic seizures are common in this population, as we said, acute symptomatic seizures due to low calcium and use of drug treatment, possibly. Repeat unprovoked seizures are present. Um, Medical record reviews show that many people have brief non-convulsive seizures. Um, epilepsy in general is associated with the development of delay and is associated with other development problems. So uh, this is interesting for those uh, who see people that you see here that in the 22Q population, 11% in our in the sample that um, Christopher looked at had a definite epileptic diagnosis. But a very large proportion had a seizure or seizure like symptoms with no epilepsy diagnosis. Uh, and in their siblings, there was no epilepsy diagnosis, but there was also a high rate of seizure or seizure like diagnosis. So, what's interesting from an epileptologist's point of view is that is there a continuum in psychology related to the genetic condition? And certainly makes, uh, from an epileptology point of view, differential diagnosis more difficult. You see something you you will have to think about the genetic impact. But his study also looked at the overlap between various conditions. And then we can look at these various um, of this one Venn diagram. And you can see the overlap with motor and tick disorder and other motor phenomena, uh, a strong motor overlap with ADHD, a strong overlap with autism. And just in this one um, condition, you can see the, one of the main issues about treating epilepsy. And in the epilepsy in this population, which is of the fact you will almost always be dealing with comorbidity and having to balance the comorbidity. So, what about the impact of epilepsy on the development and its treatment on the development of 
That is one part of the formulation. Um, in the old days, before the modern uh, new psychiatrists, I'm sure you were all, all aware, if I talked to my neurology colleagues, their problem was that they felt that psychiatrists wouldn't treat the neurological, wouldn't treat people psychiatrically because they would always send them back and say, it was caused by the epilepsy or the treatment. Um, and I think probably the converse of that was true as well for the psychiatrist's view of neurology. Now we've moved on a lot and hopefully our interaction is a bit more refined. But we do have certain broad areas to look at. So as a general, uh, as a general rule, I think psychiatrists, I, I mean, I will, fall, I will admit to myself, rare things are what we tend to look for. And so the unicorns, we're always looking for unicorns. And some of these are not so rare, but psychosis and epilepsy, particularly post psychosis, is not so rare, but we're looking for it because it's very interesting and treatable. Um, we look particularly, uh, and this isn't the case at all, but we, we look at epilepsy as a differential diagnosis of behavior disorder, which is actually let's, essentially rare as a pure a differential diagnosis. We look at epilepsy as a differential diagnosis of aggression, which is definitely very rare, and we look at fugue. So we're wanting to look at unicorns and, and look for these associations. But in fact, and we are looking at what is very common where I'm from, which is sheep. And these are the common conditions which we really should be thinking about because that people have epilepsy, common conditions which are quite probably beyond the social impact of epilepsy and some possible underlying neurological uh, predilection for this. Depression and anxiety are rarely purely just caused by epilepsy. Psychogenic seizures, of course, is not epilepsy, but it does associate with epilepsy. Drug side effects causing psychiatric symptoms. These are the common things that we have to have uh, key skills in. I'd like to thank the uh, artist who presented this through this one as well. So, rare and common, what's in front of us? Who this slide is going to sum up the most part of the formulation. We need to work out. Two elements before we get back, I think, to our psychiatric formulation. We want to work out whether the psychiatric disorder or presentation in front of us is seizure related or associated. We want to work out, work out whether it's treatment related or associated. These slides will give us more, give you more background to this. But essentially, seizure related and associated is what it says and is the simplest bit of the formulation for the person with epilepsy. And that is, is the psychiatric symptom pre-ictal? Now, obviously, what is a crucial for this particular part of formulation is the right when the seizure So we've done that and you've got a nice diary. Is it pre-ictal? When that's the case, an aura, a warning, small uh, seizures, probably focal seizures without loss of awareness are happening. So someone who um, gets sense of anxiety before their seizure or agitation, that, that may be a sign that this is a seizure-related associated uh, psychiatric disorder. Ictal psychiatric disorders are, in the main, um, the unicorns, but they're not purely the unicorns, particularly the elderly and those with intellectual disabilities. So these simple partial seizures, so a common presentation when I did general epilepsy was people who had uh, halluc uh, hallucinations in, uh, in more than one modality. Could this be a of epilepsy? Um, it wasn't usually. The non convulsive state is epilepsy, but the ictal presentation of people with confusion, delirium, dementia, a definite epilepsy diagnosis in a cycle. And then people with a developmental disorder, more popular. Um, and in this also comes fugue. Post-ictal is really possible, as there's a high rate of psychiatric disorder, post-ictally. Infusion automatism, quite common. The psychosis, not common, but a definite diagnosis one can make. So once you make that part of your assessment, you're probably going to be left with, in many situations, not having found the association you want, which makes epilepsy any more then the symptom being interictal, and therefore epilepsy is 
or its treatment is influencing the symptom. And then that moves you over to the right of the slide. So is the treatment related? This is where we are talking itself. But I think for the psychiatrist, we don't want to get too hung up on this. Yeah, at the end of it is treatment related. The odds of a simple change of treatment management are not likely. Moves, treatment moves slowly, and turning it around is of the super. I don't want to say, because if you say, I believe your depression is related to your treatment, you're really offering almost no management. The neurologist changing the epilepsy treatment. So it's not wrong, but you have to recognize that, to recognize it's going to be. But some things are treated related, so-called forced normalization. So the top of our of our pyramid here, the rare thing that's possible is a so so if you have treat you have a person has had a treatment change which has led to significant change in seizures, it might be the so-called forced normalization, uh, which um, is essentially the presentation of psychiatric symptoms in association with the change, a positive change in seizures. Uh, at, at its core, it's an EEG finding. But if this does happen, you can look at this. And my approach to this is that uh, this is a, um, an adjustment disorder to seeing the world through different eyes without speeches affecting you and a social response to people around you um, seeing you differently because you're not having your seizures. So you try and support and give time. Sometimes you will have known side effects of drugs associated with escalation, or so known side effect of surgery. In which case, yes, you can slow down the drugs. Neurologists think about drugs. Sometimes you see, and much more commonly, that a person has a psychiatric symptom and they've been on drugs a long, long time and it's attributed to the drug. Well, that's going to be very hard to disentangle. Uh, and uh, the, the so called, I think the Kepler I hear a lot. But more often, you will get general psychiatric symptomatology without association with long term drugs. And then you're going to have to treat psychiatric symptomatology and not hope for. Within treatment, right? For epilepsy itself, and people with got data and intellectual disability, I'm looking at what on what of the of the a prospective study, we're looking at the outcome of, uh, prospectively compared to non-epilepsy control, um, what psychiatric disorder appears in people with epilepsy, and interestingly, um, in this population. Uh, there was significantly more organic disorder and any psychiatric disorder and those with ongoing epilepsy compared to those with non-epilepsy. Having epilepsy definitely associates with these conditions. Here's our framework again to remind us, and then I'm going to move on to, is there any evidence to support uh, the view that we're just dealing with treatment impact and we could just look at Changing treatment, which is something I absolutely do not recommend. I believe you will, you will clearly have treatment impact, and that should be dealt with by neurology or epilepsy services. But usually, it is not treatment impact, but, it, but it's very, very, very important to families. And this is from a survey we did a, a national international survey of families' views about um, dealing with people, their, their family, their, their children with intellectual disability. And talking about medication, it's a shame how much they affect my son. When starting new medications, he's very drowsy and we lose a real him. This is powerful language. So when trying to apply and understand the effect of treatment, we have to be really very cognizant of how powerful the sense of loss can be and how far the changes are on people with developmental disorder and epilepsy. We have lost our daughter as her life is totally controlled by epilepsy. You cannot be independent. So obviously, epilepsy itself leads to loss. Um, interesting, though, when you start looking at the effects of treatment and you look at it in an evidence-based way, and this is a placebo-controlled trial on people of intellectual disability using a drug, pyramid, which is a drug, when you use it in common practice, most people would feel is quite a public definite side effect. And um, actually looking at... Um, change in the aberrant behavior checklist, the bigger the change, the more the behaviors decrease. The change was actually greater in the, in the interventional side than in the placebo side. Uh, totally not ending it. But to remind us that understanding behavior change is beyond the impact of the treatment. 
Um, and then just um, just to look at um, drug impact, this is quite a confusing study. Right, but it was uh, done by a PhD with uh, Claire Smith, who used to work with us in, in Cardiff. And this is looking at using uh, direct, I'll, I'll probably explain it as I go on. In this study, we took people with epilepsy who would start being new drugs. And we had a baseline before they started the drug. They had epilepsy and intellectual disability. They were a non randomly selected. And we used something called direct behavioral observation using what were in those days handheld Scion computers. These days, I think it would be an iPad. And in which an observer looked at the person's interaction, their responsiveness to interaction on carers, measuring it. And the idea was to look at drugs and look at this question of loss about what happens when you do start a drug if someone with complex developmental problem. The most important things for those people like which is their responsiveness and what happened. And the baseline taken us is very regular every 10 minutes interacting with someone interacts with the person, they look at their responsiveness. And they use this um stat because you you would I it's beyond me to explain. So, however, if your Q1 in, essentially means you are uh, responding all the time, when someone comes up to you, you respond. When there's something happening in the environment, you respond. The more it drops, the less you respond. So, selection of subgroups when drugs were started, I think, shows that people are different and we shouldn't come to simple conclusions about the impact of drugs. So, first subgroup had a very high number of seizures. So, look at my the arrow is on the lower graph. They were having over 40 seizures uh, per month. Um, and when they started a drug, in fact, the seizures went down, the responsiveness went up. And over time, unfortunately, their seizures went came back to normal, their responsiveness went back down. So that would, uh, I think, fit the hypothesis that their seizures may be affecting your response from the treatment. And if you try and change the seizures, you get an improvement. Um, in this group, uh, we, we can see that the people were, um, were fairly low seizure frequency, were quite responsive, um, and really nothing changed much when we gave, uh, when we gave, they didn't repay, nothing happened to the drug, whether they didn't uh, absorb the drug, whether they just were very resilient to drug change, which made them quite responsive. We don't know. In this group, uh, they had an intermediate seizure frequency, still quite high by comparison to the general population of about a month. The, the seizures uh, fell progressively, which is what you want to happen as a treatment. Um, the yield Q fell first of all, so the people became less responsive first of all. And if you had, if you had been not uh, cautious, you would have taken away the treatment. In fact, their responses came these are all people with quite severe learning disability. They're not got language. They've got the hardest people to work out what success and failure is. So that we be very cautious about how we interpret changes with drugs. Stick in there. Uh, look at the broad outcomes, such as responsiveness. But we have to do that just by asking questions, not by scions. Um, and realize that every individual may have a different experience. So what about treating the psychiatric disorder in this population? Um, I'm going to move on to this one. So the world of epilepsy has taken this very seriously because depression is so common in epilepsy and has a profound effect uh, on the outcome of, of epilepsy treatment as well as the general treatment. So they've developed a scale people like, I mean, most people on this call will be very confident in making a diagnosis of epilepsy, but you may well get people sent to you by neurological service who have used the NDDIE, it's uh, used around the world. It's the Neurological Disorder Depression Imagery for Epilepsy. And it's been designed to use a simple screening tool, um, which tries to take out the epilepsy drug-related patient fatigue. Try and be more precise. This is used frequently in the world of epilepsy. Um, and just very frequent, frequent Recently, depression treatment guidelines have been made. Now, I know you all can treat depression. The lecture on how to treat depression. But I think it, what does seem to happen that in psychiatric services, depression isn't treated for people with epilepsy. And I do think this is down to 
concerns over treatment impact. And um, in this, I think it, the main message is that in these international depression guidelines, um, internationally against epilepsy, whilst psychological treatment is clearly the first treatment option, and whilst the treatment plan mimics and mirrors that you would use in any other population, a, in the world of epilepsy, we believe it is appropriate to use antidepressants, and we believe they are not, not promote worsening. Having said that, BNF believes they do, and then, therefore one has to warn people about seizure worsening. We support the use of antidepressants. But the treatment of choice is definitely psychological. Okay, moving on. There is other important guidance that might help you when trying to dis look at uh, uh, treating psychological disorder in this epilepsy, psychological disorder, people with epilepsy with disorder. And one of uh, an area which is extremely well researched and is very strongly researched in the United Kingdom is non epileptic attack disorder. People have noted that the disorder 100% gets non epileptic. Psychiatrists are often asked to treat. The evidence for treatment is there for CBT. Um, is, is relatively low, apart from comorbid. But I think psychiatrist is, is sometimes given something of a hospital class to look after this population. And, I, and that the paper I just mentioned is extremely useful as it shows a graded approach to understanding how well the diagnosis of non attack disorder has been made. And I think it's a psych, we're dealing with this because I've dealt with this population from both sides of the fence, if you like. Um, when dealing with this population, it's commonly what happens all the time is the diagnosis is valid. The person has not got epilepsy, they've got like disorder, not epilepsy. But the story changes when you meet the person your anxiety rises, is it really not epilepsy? And I think it's worth looking at this to see that how solid was the diagnosis that was sent to you? And the most solid is uh, the documented mission experience in the diagnosis of semiology shown on a video EEG, no EEGs. Unfortunately, because in neurodevelopmental disorder, taking part in telemetry, taking part in complex EEG, just doesn't happen. We will be dealing with people where there is clinical equipoise, where the diagnosis is just not. And therefore, you have to be able to handle the equipoise and handle the fact that you deal, work closely with your neurological colleagues, but also try and approach the, the non epileptic Treatment guidance, also treatment guidance for the treatment of uh, ADHD in children with epilepsy, uh, quite detailed and very well uh, looked at as is the make of most things that come out of pediatric neurology. Um, and uh, the key thing here is the recommendation that methylphenidate is tolerated and effective in children with epilepsy and comorbid ADHD, again, to try and remove treatment barriers related to drug effect. Move on quite quickly. Uh, so antipsychotics I want to mention because they are perhaps the most complicated area in this. Uh, beware in behavior appropriate in psychosis with very clear risk assessment. Um, antipsychotic treatments, as we know from this classic paper by Kenneth Alper, do increase seizure risk in the trials. Those people who don't have epilepsy. But we are cautious of, of antipsychotics, but of course the conditions they are profound, and it's all about risk. Lastly, I'll just come to this paper from uh, Sinead Brothy in Swansea University, which looked at the routine use of antipsychotics um, in, in, in children uh, in Wales. Particularly looking at children with intellectual difficulty uh, and autism. I know we got some pediatric uh, and child psychiatrists out there. There is just is a case that these children are more likely to try antipsychotics. So, particularly if they've got autism compared with children without intellectual disability, they were prescribed them at a younger age and for younger periods. Antipsychotic use associated with a higher rate of respiratory illness uh, for admissions to hospital. Uh, and for those with intellectual disability, autism was a higher rate of injury and hospitalized depression than those prescribed antipsychotics. So there was less non less depression diagnosed in primary care. 
If you look at the risks in epilepsy, just so I know, there's a, well, the risks in this population were 2.5 times higher rate of diabetes, um, contact of GP or hospital for those who was prescribed an antipsychotic, and the odds of diabetes increased in the year they were on the antipsychotic and as they got older. The injury is more complicated. Epilepsy, taking only those who prescribed antipsychotics during the year on antipsychotics and off, with one. 0.4 higher rate than epilepsy. Antipsychotics are more comfortable. So I've gone through quite a lot. I got a little bit confused about time, but I think I've been going for 40 minutes. Um, this is a massive area, and I hope we've given you some insight and some clues, but there's so much more to it. Successful management of behavior, psychological illness, and people with developmental disorder is definitely complex. Neuropsychiatric support essential within epilepsy treatment centers. I haven't even got close to talking about how we deliver care, but one of the main problems is the, is the, just the lack of support. To the nature of understanding of behavior, psychological presentation is even more complex, including genetics, life stress, seizure frequency, treatment, all offering influences on individual presentation. Management, which is not about the epilepsy, needs a complex MDT and be very cautious with that. Thank you. Hopefully we're on some sort of timing. Thank you very much, Mike, for this very interesting talk. Um, I hope you all can hear me all right by now. Actually, uh, I would just inform that there is some sort of a problem in the Zoom server connection. Um, but I think that we're better now. Uh, yes, so um, uh, because we went a little bit over time, uh, can I request those who have... Um, questions for Professor Kerr to put them on the chat box and uh, uh, Professor Kerr, you have time to answer them on the chat box or via email later on. That will be greatly appreciated. Now we will be breaking for lunch. And if you all can come back at, um, uh, right. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, I think that uh, sadly it will be a little bit shorter just to keep everything on time. So 1.30, please. And uh, Professor Brugger will give his talk then. Thank you very much.